Okay, good. So uh, when you're ready, we're, we're happy to, to listen to whatever you have to say. So. Okay, so it's open now for point full screen. Great. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you to the Membre du Jury uh, for your patience, especially today with the sound problems. I'm very happy and excited to present uh, you my four year long work um, that consisted in atlasing um, the weight matter of the human brain um, with uh, magnetic resonance diffusion, MRI, um, um, tractography um, of diffusion images obtained with MRI. Um, Catherine, uh, you aren't sharing your screen. We can't see your PowerPoint. Oh. Sorry for that. Because I can't access Zoom anymore now. Ah, yes, wonderful. Partager. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for letting me know. Now I see also people on Zoom at the same time. So again, very sorry for everything. <laughs> Let's jump to the presentation. So what we see this is about, um, it's about making an atlas. Um, with this uh, particular type of uh, magnetic resonance imaging uh, or MRI, that is uh, diffusion um, um, MRI. I'll start with um, a general uh, introduction that should take around 50, uh, 50 minutes to um, situate our work uh, in the field and also on the um, timeline of um, scientific progress um, of anatomical knowledge. And also to show you a little bit what has justified um, this project. Then we'll talk about the experimental part of the project itself um, that has ultimately led to um, delivering two separate atlases. Uh, a first one was um, restricted to the frontal lobe, and the second one was an atlas of the entire brain. So the, the two steps um, are actually related. Like the first one was um, um, that was us testing our pipeline, developing our pipeline. Um, but I still wanted to talk about it because it has actually led to a publication. We published this first um, prototype atlas um, because it was working, it was good. So we published it and uh, we were lucky um, to have it uh, implemented in a great software, the BCB Toolkit. And for uh, around uh, three years, it has been uh, used by people and we had a lot of feedback, quite a lot of feedback on, from uh, its users through scientific literature. Uh, and I will talk more about that in the, um, in the last part, uh, the general discussion part of uh, the presentation that we'll, uh, we'll also try to keep short uh, around 15 minutes. Um, And in the general discussion, we'll also talk about what are the potential other uses that we can do with uh, our final product, that is the atlas of the entire brain. So let's dive to it. Just one last second. Sorry. So through the history of, um, of brain research, neuroanatomy has uh, proved to be uh, um, the real um, lingua franca, the communication uh, mean of different 
people coming together to work toward the same goal. Um, because no matter your culture, your background, scientific background, like mathematics or science or uh, uh, medicine, um, everybody can understand what we're talking about when we are using the same terminology, um, anatomical terminology, which is great. But anatomy is not only a language. It's also, it has also been used as a tool and um, that can sound a little strange how a language can also be a tool to, to make discoveries uh, on the brain. So to apprehend this tool concept, uh, let me uh, take this very simple example. Uh, if you compare your hand and your foot, um, just like with the naked eye in, in infection, you can uh, see that they are in general similar. You have five fingers, five toes, but they um, are used for completely different things. There are completely different functions. One to wrap object, the other one to walk. Um, so on the same principle, I have um, another example, um, a classical example of bird beaks. So when you look at this um, picture, can you um, guess among my birds, uh, like on the one on the right panel or on the left panel, uh, which ones eat uh, nectar, which ones eat insects? So you can place your bets. <laughs> uh, and um, I'm sure you guessed it right. Um, the, the, those birds, um, eat the nectar, the other one, um, meat. Um, how did you guess it? My question is how by simply looking at those birds, you could, you could guess uh, what is their diet? And um, the answer is simple, uh, or maybe not. It's the shape of their beaks. Um, the big ones are for um, breaking bark and trees and the long ones like straws are made for drinking nectar um, inside the flower. So through this um, very simple um, comparative anatomy game um, that uh, Sir Darwin uh, appreciated so much, um, it's easy to grasp the concept uh, of uh, how the function can shape uh, the form and um, how shape can lead us to um, guess a function of an organ. And actually it's sometimes easy to access um, the, the topology, the anatomy of an organ uh, than uh, to explore how we use it. Um, so what if uh, form and function are uh, always tangled, like everywhere in our body, not only in um, things that are uh, superficial, apparent to us. We could use this anatomical trick to our advantage to investigate uh, complex brain functions, for example, if they have a, an impact uh, relation to anatomical features. Um, and indeed, uh, to this day, we're still trying to understand um, this very sophisticated organ that is the brain. And a lot of unsolved mystery remain. Mm. So to, to, to understand, uh, to, to continue on this, uh, how to apply anatomy as a tool uh, for studying function. I just need to present you uh, with some basic um, concepts about uh, um, what is brain, what is nervous tissue um, on different scales. Um, because we can talk about microscopic anatomy or uh, microscopic anatomy. They are different, but they are actually um, very related. Um, on, I like to uh, explain brain um, structure um, with these 
analogy with transport systems. Um, for example, at the microscopic scale, you can compare um, nervous tissue to um, metro map, like uh, so the Parisian metro map, where uh, cells, um, well, the bodies of cells are like stations, uh, metro stations, and elongations uh, are like railways connecting different stations. And uh, messages, electrical messages, can run through um, these elongations. Um, the overall uh, makes a complex network in our brain um, that is all connected and that can be mapped at the wire diagram. Um, fortunately um, for us, there is also um, um, such network at, uh, at the macroscopic level. Indeed, um, we can compare it to another kind of uh, system. Um, if you look at the general um, layout of the brain in the middle of the slide, um, you see how both are related. On the top in the little circle, you have the uh, microscopic view of the tissue. And uh, beyond that, like the, the, chouffle, the sort of flower that you have beyond this, um, you can see like on a slide of the brain, the different layers um, of uh, different kind of structures because brain is, the brain is a layered structure. Um, on top, on the surface, you have gray matter, which is made of all the cell uh, bodies, all the um, um, processing um, units, components of the neurons. And uh, the white matter that is uh, below is made of um, elongations, the longest one that are called accents. Uh, that are like um, very, uh, like like electric wires, and they run connecting different uh, gray matter regions uh, to each other, which is this time more um, closer to what we could see uh, between the continents. Um, like it's um, it's now different at the macroscopic scale because in, like in the metro, with this analogy with the metro, you have only uh, on each elongation, on each railway, you have only one way to, to, to send your information or your metro cards. Uh, on the sea, uh, that would be uh, um, compared to white matter, you have a lot of different possibilities and a lot of routes that are maritime routes that can channel cargoes, different cargoes. And um, there is like no one unique uh, way. You have several different routes, but uh, if you look at the overall, you can see some, um, some packaging, some bundling, some routes are uh, closer. Uh, with some uh, fiber ties so close that they form bigger roots. Um, because actually, these are the most practical ways, the short ones, most practical to connect uh, big uh, portuaire uh, areas. So, um, this is uh, my favorite analogy to explain a little bit the brain. Uh, another thing I wanted to say about. Uh, brain anatomy is um, that the cortical anatomy, uh, cortex, have already been mapped. Uh, why is it it's important? Because um, going back to our map analogy, if you are a tourist uh, in a city, you have to know your way to found a certain monument you want to explore, you want to see. It's the same when you study the brain. If you have a goal in mind, it's better that you can find your way in uh, the organ or uh, if you compare your organ to the city. So um, for uh, centuries, people have been uh, mapping uh, especially cortical uh, areas. 
historically, um, they were more focused on that. They were thought more important than white matter. I will tell you more about that later. Um, so on the surface, actually, the brain is not smooth. There are bumps and grooves. So uh, there are uh, superficial landmarks uh, that are called uh, sulky and diary um, that can be used also um, as uh, markers for people who want to locate themselves when they're doing something on the brain like research. Also, interesting link between microscopic uh, anatomy and uh, microscopic is um, those uh, maps that are called Brodmann area maps. Um, um, Oops, sorry, I have a problem of battery. Power. Sorry. Um, yes, so um, the Broadman areas were mapped based on. Um, uh, microscopic uh, arrangement of cell bodies in the cortex um, and the maps and the, this parcellation that you can see here, um, oops, that you can see here is visible at a uh, macroscopic uh, level, even if it's based on microscopic uh, features of the brain. So, um, now that we have all these um, basic concepts in mind, we can go back to um, how comparative anatomy uh, has helped us to um, understand, better understand the brain. Um, actually, it's, um, it was working the other way around. It started the other way around. So uh, let's imagine um, that the, um, first time it was being used, it was um, with patients, with the patient that um, came to the physician who happened also to study the brain. And the patient uh, had um, anatomical um, problem in his brain, like cancer or a stroke or trauma. Um, so he had a, an area of his brain damaged. And unfortunately for him, uh, something was impaired. Um, also, like the patient had um, clinical symptoms, like the incapacity to talk, for example, to speak. So, um, um, they started the lesion approach to understand uh, brain functions. Because in this case, uh, what you can say is that um, the uh, the loss of uh, this anatomical area, uh, if it's associated with loss of a function, it means that this area is essential for this function. And you can, uh, with this kind of logic, infer um, function to certain brain areas. So this, at the beginning, was being done in two different ways. The bad way with the phrenology, uh, and the good way with the localizationism. And I, I allow myself to say that phrenology is bad because it's done in a kind of sloppy way because um, things that were associated with functions like were more like um, arbitrary features like form of the skull, with intelligence, things like that. Uh, but it was very popular and actually used this um, this good way to do science at the beginning, but it was fight racism, etc. And um, now not really uh, popular. The other way was the localizationism uh, school, the localizationist school of thought, uh, which consisted relied heavily on lesion approach to uh, map the entire um, gray matter brain cortex. Um, uh, to look at these, they spent a lot of time um, finding for different functions, different gray matter centers, mm -hmm. which is absolutely great because 
We still use um, all those findings nowadays, but they forgot something really important. They completely neglected white matter. And white matter is um, actually something really important because sometimes you also have uh, patients, for example, that don't have a lesion in the great matter um, that it was at the beginning considered um, to carry all the centers for um, brain functioning. But sometimes the lesion is located inside, deep in the brain, in the white matter, and uh, the patient still has uh, symptoms, which uh, has been interpreted uh, in the associationism um, um, conceptual framework as uh, the fact that um, lesion can have uh, distant effects. Um, it's the disconnection principle. Uh, if two centers that play an important role in a function don't interact, can't send information to each other, they can't work properly and the function is still impaired. Um, Unfortunately, from at the beginning, localizationists, they completely, uh, they have done the complete opposite of localizationists. They neglected gray matter, they overinterpreted the role of white matter. And um, nowadays, what we use as a model is something in between, um, like the right middle between the um, um, gray matter centric and the white matter centric models. So we are probably like in the era, new, new associationist era. Um, um, yeah, I will not talk too much about the Odyssey with all the important persons uh, contributed to anatomy because actually I think I've already explained the basic concepts and it's already long enough. Um, but what I can uh, say uh, in summary is that um, the actual exploration of anatomy um, beyond the, the, the lesion approach, um, we had to research back in time, had to put their hands inside uh, the thing to understand how it, its architecture, its topology. Uh, so how it was done at the beginning with growth anatomy, which basically means you um, you get um, post-mortem specimen, you slice it open, you explore with your scalpel, um, everything that is in the brain. And you draw pictures um, of what you have seen, of what you have seen. Uh, like the one in the middle here. Mm. The problem was at the beginning is gross dissection. Like that, um, with, with gross dissection, you don't really see a difference between gray and white matter. Um, white matter appeal, uh, appear as um, goop. So if you want to really uh, see fibers, you need, to, you need to do something more. So uh, people started by uh, boiling brains. It helped to um, um, harden uh, white matter and uh, making it easier to sort of feel to separate. And uh, people started to notice some um, structures uh, that were different from the rest of the matter. Um, it was not enough, so it, it has evolved, the technique has evolved with um, um, putting brains in alcohol, so with chemical fixation, up to the Kringler techniques, um, where um, scientists uh, freeze the brain, um, kill fibers, uh, fiber by fiber. Um, but there was at the time a huge problem. When you are doing this, you remove the cortex. Um, so to access white matter, first you, you uh, slice the gray matter, and unfortunately you lose 
the terminal portions of your fibers. So you can't really see where they protect on the cortex. So you can't really know what gray matter centers they connect. This is why uh, another methodological approach became uh, popular with the uh, one of um, the, the, the most famous uh, um, couple of anatomists uh, who have worked on that are the Dejahins of French people, you who, um, with, um, that I wanted to represent here with a uh, caricature from Parabin uh, Journal, the Ricus, the Smirk in English, uh, showing how they sliced together as a couple of brains, like so such. And actually, this is what they was, were doing um, with histology. Um, and microscopy. Um, you slice your brain, you stain your slices, you look at everything under a microscope, and you can see um, microscopic arrangements um, and layouts of uh, brain cells. So, on one hand, um, you had ways to see um, the general uh, 3D structure with graphs and anatomy. And on the other hand, you could um, get something more um, accurate regarding uh, terminations. But unfortunately, uh, it could not be used uh, alone, histology, as um, it was based on slices, these slices to map a 3D structure, which means that uh, people reading the atlas of the disciplines, for example, had to um, reconstruct everything in, the, in their head, understand the actual 3D structure. Um, so what was um, the problem? Uh, with those techniques, because we um, we did not use that for our atlas, we used something else. So, um, what are the limitations, major limitations of those techniques? Both are based on postmortem specimens, so um, it would be legitimate. Um, it was legitimate at the time for people to ask themselves if anatomy of um, living uh, brain was the same um, as that was mapped in uh, atlases based on dead specimens. So the solution, there were two solutions to that. First, it's not pacing. Um, I will not talk too much about that because it's based on animal models. Um, you use animal brains that you have to sacrifice. So again, like uh, histology and gross dissection, it's uh, it's uh, it costs a lot in terms of uh, moral, in terms of uh, money, in terms of time. Uh, not easy to access. Not easy to do. The other huge revolution that was game changer was uh, the advent of MRI techniques. Um, for the first time, it became possible to look inside um, the, the human brain um, before uh, it was dead. And uh, also in a quite um, um, non-dangerous uh, way, actually. Um, you don't inject something, uh, you don't slice, you don't cut, you don't harm. Uh, participants, you can acquire a lot of uh, images with um, MRI um, machines, um, even if it's um, not cheap, it's still accessible and more accessible than accessing um, the finding uh, post-mortem specimens. Um, with MRI, um, there were a lot of different uh, sequences invented, sequences um, like a plan that you give to your machine to uh, look at some things in a particular in the brain. Um, 
in our case, we used a um, specific category um, of uh, MRI sequences that are the diffusion-weighted uh, diffusion imaging sequences that were developed based on the idea to perform sort of, um, virtual biopsies, so to really access the microstructure of uh, our brain. But uh, at the end, we can also access the microstructure. So how um, does this work, the MRI? I think uh, I have to tell you some basic principles about that, because this is actually the method that we use to build our atlas. Um, with diffusion-weighted sequences, like for all uh, MRI sequences, uh, you, um, you have to divide um, your brain based that you study uh, in uh, VOG cells that are like cells, but in 3D, uh, because MRI is based on, um, um, on a physical phenomenon um, that uh, at the beginning was, um, was basically just um, for one little space uh, at the time. So with this machine, uh, you'll explore many spaces. Uh, at the same time, because you artificially divide um, the, 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 the area, the object that you scan in voxels. Um, what you do with your MRI uh, during the sequence is that you tag um, the hydrogen um, of water molecules, like the most common way to do this. Um, you will pack them upstream with the machine and they will send you back um, signals that you can collect and translate. Um, uh, hydrogen in water molecules, we have plenty of that everywhere in all of our tissues and of course in the brain too. Um, so in our body, like in a glass of water, um, molecules will move randomly. This is this process is called uh, diffusion because molecules collide um, with uh, thermal energy due to thermal energy. Um, what we will collect is uh, with diffusion weighted imaging um, is a, a signal that will translate how water molecules. Uh, that will show how water molecules diffuse in our tissues because they don't diffuse everywhere in the same manner. Um, for example, um, when the diffusion is not perfect, like in a glass of water, um, when there are no obstacles, we uh, can say that the diffusion is isotropic. Um, this is what almost happened uh, in our gray matter, because um, it's just matter with some cellular bodies here and there, and water can randomly diffuse. There are obstacles, but um, they are randomly placed uh, in the space. So at the end, the result is quite the same that in a glass of water. However, in white matter, um, you have fibers. What I have not said before is that these fibers uh, are coated with a fatty substance that is um, the myelin that prevents the um, uh, exit of charges um, of electric messages when they run along those fibers. And fat is um, not friend with water. So what molecules um, if they are inside axons, they will move inside the axon. Uh, if they are outside, they will move along axons. And all in all, what you see is an anisotropic diffusion, where um, if you sum up all the movements, at the end, you have one preferred direction of diffusion. Um, Oops, sorry, I forgot to change my slide. 
So um, this is the illustration of um, what I was talking about. Uh, great matter here, water molecules diffuse randomly here. They diffuse in a, um, an isotropic manner. So with our MRI, like I said, we divide the space in voxels. OK, here it's a projection, but concept is the same. Um, Um, in each voxel, um, with your MRI sequence, developed to be sensitized to uh, the diffusion of water molecules. Um, you will see in each voxel something like that. Um, like this is um, the trajectory of one molecule in gray matter. This uh, is what it will look like uh, in uh, white matter. Um, with a uh, certain mathematical formalism, um, we were able to um, transform the signals that we got um, in uh, ellipse uh, or rounds or in uh, 3D in uh, spheres on ellipsoids. So, so this is a way to represent with uh, eigenvectors um, how a molecule uh, of water diffuse in, um, in the tissue that is uh, scanned. Because I've lost my text. And I'm quite an untrue person when it's about to talk in public. So, mm -mm -mm. okay. Um, I'll continue with that. So, um, Okay, here is, we can see what is going on in uh, two typical um, voxels, one in gray matter, the other one in white matter. On the entire slice, it will look um, like something um, like that. Uh, you will have for each voxel uh, an ellipse that represent uh, what's going on with what molecules in this voxel. Um, from there, um, how can you use this kind of maps to um, find, find um, actual fibers? You will use something um, um, you will use anisotropy as, um, as a, a probe of what's going on in the tissues uh, thanks to um, 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 uh, reconstitution of uh, the trajectories uh, based on um, the principal direction of diffusion. So if you, um, if you imagine that you start from here, uh, you see this, um, you follow the main axis of your uh, ellipsoids trace um, streamlines. And you do this step by step from voxel to voxel. And you can do this on your entire brain scan, on your entire slice, and you'll have at the end streamlines. They do not represent uh, individual white matter fibers or axons. They represent um, like the mean, um, uh, the mean behavior of water molecules, but they, um, um, they um, show us um, what is going on on a structural point of view, why they behave like that, we can, uh, we can imagine um, because of fibers running uh, like that. And at the end, what you get as streamlines is 
actually really close to what you would see with um, um, histology. Um, for example, in this example, why I want to show this is that from the same gray matter uh, center area, you actually have two different populations of fibers. So you have two different white matter bundles or fascicles or tracts um, that you can differentiate thanks to um, track, a tracking algorithm that will use the uh, uh, MRI data on diffusion. Um, this is still an indirect technique. Um, you can see that we have uh, used a lot of approximation. It's very indirect of indirect. You use water to approximate this and then you sort of approximate that. Um, and um, with, uh, initially with these kind of methods, um, it was not always great to um, represent um, areas where fiber crossed or uh, kissed, and they run like that. Um, it was impossible to untangle them with tractography algorithms. So research has progressed, and uh, with better algorithm, um, algorithms, with better uh, sequences, like optimized uh, MRI sequences, we were able more and more uh, to get um, uh, more directions, um, more access. Like you had, now, you have, uh, you can see the diffusion not only like an edit speed, but actually like a flower with petals in different directions uh, along uh, the different x, y, z, z axis uh, of an orthonormal repair. Okay, now with this technique, which is uh, wonderful, um, is um, that you can have a lot of uh, images. You can uh, acquire, you can scan a lot of participants, you can construct cords. Um, but that would not be very interesting if uh, you couldn't compare them because uh, all humans have different, they have different sizes, features, etc. So to be um, able to compare them, you have to uh, normalize them, like put them in a stereotactic space. So this is also another story of uh, brain research, the development of uh, um, templates, normalization, um, stereotactic spaces. We work in a stereotactic space to produce our assets, of course, uh, because we had to um, do uh, calculate averages of um, facts that, that, that we had dissected. Um, so what, just a word on that. Um, I was already talking about dissection because um, with um, the tracking algorithms, what you will have um, is uh, like a what you will obtain at the end of your uh, tracking algorithm uh, session is a ball of uh, uh, hundred thousand of um, streamlines, and it's like uh, having uh, on hand a real human brain. Uh, you can't do a lot with it like that. You have to dissect it, and uh, you can do it virtually. Um, you have your diagram, which like is. Uh, the, um, the sum of all the fibers, um, all the streamlines uh, um, that you have uh, reconstructed, and you um, can segregate different fibers according to uh, landmarks, ac uh, according to cortical landmarks, according to your knowledge, a priori knowledge of um, the structures, with um, what you want to find or sometimes in an exploratory way or you try like you pick and you, you, you with a try and error you can find also interesting things um, how you can do that with um, software um, a software that um, where you can create 3d ROIs 
um, which means uh, volumes, you can draw manually volumes um, and say to your software um, that uh, I want only fibers that uh, go, that pass, um, that, no, that start in uh, this blue, dark blue ROI and that uh, end in this uh, purple ROI, for example. Um, and this allows you to extract uh, in the entire tractogram that is schematically represented here, uh, only certain fibers that you want. You can also um, choose to use your region of interest, ROI region of interest, as um, a passing through region, um, and you will retain only fibers that go through the region. Um, depending on where you place it, like the difference between the yellow and the pink one, uh, depending on where you place your ROI, even if it's a slightly, if it's slightly different, you will still have very different results. So um, it's a process that you have to put a lot of thoughts uh, into because um, it's almost like you have to plan what you will do. You have to design these actual formulas, uh, like mathematical formulas, uh, using Boolean rules, the and or not rules, and selection criteria in the software. Um, define um, how uh, what you want from the software. Um, you can also exclude certain streamlines, so you can clean um, your dissection from uh, any artifact. And uh, with photography, of course, artifact, they happen a lot because it's a reconstruction algorithm. Um, so you have uh, the mean, clean everything through uh, length thresholds. You just say, I don't want fibers that are shorter than three millimeters, for example, because this is noise. Uh, you can also uh, create uh, like glove arrows around a certain uh, lobe or area of the brain to uh, eliminate everything that will go beyond because you will say this is also fake fibers, like fused different um, fibers erroneously fused together that have nothing to do with uh, the deception. And you can also do the same thing as uh, with inclusion arrows that you see on the right. But this time you will say to the software that they are supposed to exclude fibers, that they are exclusionary rights. So you have um, a lot of strategies to dissect a program. And um, this is how we um, uh, created our uh, atlases. So the first one, like I said, was um, first step, the prototypical atlas we started with. Um, but it was good at the end, so we published it, and um, we could have enough uh, feedback on uh, um, what we had done. And during, we, we, did the, uh, we got the, this feedback while we were um, upgrading, uh, optimizing our dissection pipeline for the next step. So we were doing uh, the dissection of the whole brain atlas, and we were getting notifications of uh, what people were doing or criticizing. Um, we'll talk about this later. Um, so, um, to simplify the things, as it's like two steps of the same process, let's uh, just talk about the whole brain atlas. Um, I don't want to be repetitive. Uh, and uh, of course, the second one is better than the first one, so it's better to talk just about this one for now. Um, you can see, I'm going to read the article because it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, so for the whole brain atlas, um, we work with HCP uh, data, uh, data the data set, the seven tests that I said. Um, I think you already know that in HCP you have um, different data sets. Tesla translates the intensity of the magnet of the MRI um, that, um, um, that, in, that can impact uh, the resolution um, of uh, the images that you get. So we had to choose between 3D and 3D um, data of a 
but same of the same subjects, the same um, participants. So we chose to work on the seventh data. Um, and uh, here is our pipeline. So what I was saying before is, um, okay, we did all the pre-processing. So that, um, which is um, what I told you before uh, about the tracking algorithms. Um, so we did that and we obtained um, the diagrams of our uh, 178 uh, participants. Uh, for um, in each subject, we uh, dissected um, the most um, uh, Facts um, we could, everything that was possible, uh, available in the literature, um, facts that we have already had already dissected in the previous atlas, but also known facts, um, tracks that have been hypothesized or well known facts, uh, because um, each time you do an atlas, it's better to do everything from the beginning, all the tracks. Uh, you can't. Um, you can't really work later with composite atlases uh, where you take one pack from one atlas, the other one from the other. Um, best atlas would be the most comprehensive atlas because um, it can be used for everything. Uh, and it's not a Frankenstein atlas. So we did all that. Um, how we did this? Uh, we try to be smart because 178 subjects, it's a lot. So we designed perfect ROIs, perfect regions of interest, ideal dissections formulas for us, but also because um, we had some feedback from people uh, using the first atlas and we were surprised. They were very interested in uh, the method uh, with the pipeline with uh, on the, by our ROIs. Um, we thought it's, it might be interesting to provide also these formulas and ROIs uh, for people to replicate our work to um, do the same on their own court or on patients or to even be um, able to explore see what we have done, which is usually, um, it's not usual uh, in uh, the field to, to, to have to get the regions of interest for this section and this section formula is like very precise. Um, because it's difficult to do this if you don't work uh, on a normalized data set. Um, here it's possible because we created uh, standard ROIs. Um, all our track programs were deformed, uh, normalized, put in the standard space. So we could draw uh, one set of ROI, ROIs for the entire cord and to and optimize it, um, trying the ROIs on one participant then on the other, looking what was uh, good or not. And because there is a variability, um, even when you normalize, you still have a lot of differences in brains. So compensate um, for uh, the differences and the fact that we had only one set of inclusion ROIs, we sometimes um, had to adapt exclusion ROIs to be specific to the court, not specific to each individual, but in the total court, like we had an exclusion ROIs, um, uh, one side of the exclusion ROIs were meant, was meant for one subject, the other side for another. So at the end, we had like um, a global uh, exclusion ROI for the um, entire court, but taking into account um, the individual variability, respecting their differences. So um, um, this here represents the um, setting of ROIs. Uh, maybe it's a little small, but um, here you see inclusion ROIs. Like you have, uh, uh, you start with the entire spectrum. Oh, I didn't need to present it on the right. Um, you start with the entire spectrum. Um, you put a first ROI, inclusion region. In a, in a place of the brain that you want to, that you know that fibers 
that make the track uh, run through. So the blue, the dark blue one. And um, uh, with the second formula, uh, software only um, shows you fibers that go through this uh, region. You add then a second one. Ah, when you when you do that, sorry, you already you can already guess uh, the track that you're trying to dissect if you are familiar with the track. So it's here in orange. Um, you continue your dissection process by adding a second region of interest, the light blue one, um, and you get at the end a perfectly isolated uh, white matter track. Uh, that is just the ensemble of um, streamlines that represent the track. And it's perfect because you have cleaned it with this um, pink exclusion ROI. So at this step, you um, propagate your uh, dissection scene, scenes, because there were a lot, a lot of tracks, a lot of scenes, a lot of dissection formulas. So you propagate this on all uh, the participants of your cohort, and for each one, you'll have one track. Uh, they're all different. That, that's um, that's great. They are in the same normative space, but they are so different. Um, so here you have a closer view on those streamlines. Um, to work with them, we have to binarize them. Um, so we transform every voxel um, that contains at least one fiber in a positive voxel. Uh, like we say, okay, this volume will be part of uh, our uh, final volume, the binarized volume, working on the one uh, or zero um, uh, formula yet to know um, um, principle. Then, when you have all your binarized volumes of all the tracks, individual tracks, you can uh, do a simplest thing in the world. You can calculate a mean volume, uh, calculation of mean. You sum everything and you divide by the number of uh, participants in, in your cohort. Um, and here you have your uh, mean fact. That looks uh, something like that. Um, but it's not, um, it's not a volume that is um, the same everywhere. I mean, the, um, the, the, the volume, the map, the mean map contain, contains information. In each voxel, there is uh, a number which corresponds to uh, the percentage of um, individuals uh, who have a fiber, like um, binary voxel, who have something uh, at this uh, place. Mm, so here, for example, we can say that um, in 40% uh, in, uh, uh, of the population, there, were, there was a streamline here in this box. Um, so we can, this map, we can display it like that. It would be possible. Um, and actually, um, we will make them available online for people who want to use them unthresholded, native. But um, it was wise because it's it was wise to threshold the maps. Why that? Um, let me try this uh, analogy with trees. <laughs> um, if you want to explore like the main topology of the tree, um, of the trees of uh, of the forest, uh, you will uh, like overlay uh, the. Um, the contrast, the silhouette, and um, what will be representative of the general shape of the trees of your forest is this darkest, um, this darkest area of the overlay of all the tree silhouettes. So you want to 
do the same thing with our um, mean maps. We want to present to people only voxels that are representative of um, of um, the anatomy that is the most most often found in people. Um, so we decided to do a cutoff a threshold um, at uh, the 19th century, which means that we uh, kept um, only, um, I always say it backwards. <laughs> um, let me just read it right. Um, here, Well, okay, that we, we just kept um, the 10 the 10 percent of um, voxels that had the highest um, um, numbers um, in our entire distribution of uh, values um, and this can be discussed because um, um, it's arbitrary some people will, would do it differently uh, it depends on what you want and some people would want an unfolded map. Mm. In this address, I will uh, present thresholded maps, uh, mean thresholded maps at the 19th uh, percent, um, with the 19th percent threshold, uh, 19th uh, centile threshold, not percent. Mm, that's what I say, I say it back, backwards to the time. Um, 19th century threshold. So we present mean maps like that and um, the kind of unthresholded information which is represented by individual scans, um, individual uh, dissections in random participants to show um, cortical projections. Because what you can see here is when you threshold your map, when you keep only the yellow voxels, you lose um, cortical. Um, voxels. So you don't really see in this kind of maps where uh, white matter tracks put. So the results now uh, it will be short because I want to discuss every fact <laughs> um, in the thesis um, that are welcome to, uh, to download when it will be available. There is, uh, there will, there is um, like a deep dive in each track history and uh, uh, anatomy and uh, sometimes debates on uh, its uh, anatomy. But here, um, globally, what, uh, what uh, we delivered, the prototype, the first atlas, that's the frontal lobe atlas, made of um, 55 uh, frontal tracks on a court of 47 participants. On the final uh, atlas, the whole brain atlas, um, we uh, got um, um, 152 white matter facts um, in the court of 178 young adults. So here you can uh, see the overview of all the texts that we present in this atlas. How do we present them? Um, we gave a lot of thoughts to how to present them at best and to be um, user-friendly in the way we present this. So here is an example. For example, let's look at the frontal longitudinal system. It's a, it's a, frontal, uh, it's a system of frontal uh, longitudinal tracts. Um, made of uh, one, two, three, four, five tracks. Um, we mapped, uh, one of them uh, is mapped here for the first time ever. It was already mapped in some, uh, in the small cords, cords. Uh, so it just started to be explored. 
and so it was not it, it's not it was not present so far in the atlases the meso anterior fasciculus um, so for each uh, set of tracts for each system or individual tract um, we presented the regions of interest that we used to isolate the tracts um, along with the color coded tree uh, the colors were carefully designed, um, easily found, uh, um, um, always different, easily found because paired with other, uh, with the color of the track, so the rice have a specific color, etc. Um, everything to make it easy to read. So we present the rise um, with a 3D view um, and a more classical way on slices also. Um, then we show um, the mean map, the thresholded mean map, maps of all parts of the system, of each system, um, in 3D from different views. Um, and also, like I said, um, the uh, the tracks in one uh, random participant um, to show how, what you would actually see if you dissect by yourself, uh, patient, person, uh, what, you, what you should expect to see when you do uh, the manual dissection on your own. Um, here is um, um, demonstration of what you can actually see in the software and to give you this 3D feel that is sometimes missing from um, images even if they are rendered in 3D. Oops. Oops. Voilà. Here is another one. And here is another one. Um, uh, here, uh, the last one is in one participant. The two, uh, the first ones are the mean uh, maps. Um, I also put here, I've also put here um, another system. Um, and I'm seeing that the resolution is awful in this slide. Uh, so this is uh, another system that was not um, that we explored in the first atlas, but that is not so well known because here too we uh, reported to complete the original tracks. This is like an example that I take to, to show you that sometimes we in, a, in each system we have tracks that are well mapped, some are not mapped at all, some are debated, etc. So here um, is the Antular uh, Proximal Associative System, which is the ensemble of short U-shaped tracks that come out the insula um, toward the other lobes. So uh, the mean uh, maps look something like that. They have like this oyster structure. Um, and um, the first one uh, was not known, um, but you could map it and then found, find traces of uh, its potential existence through uh, other modalities, uh, through fun functional uh, modalities. Um, so this was part of the discussion on each system, this kind of uh, um, um, findings coming from anatomy, because actually, um, this fact, we decided it because it was here, it was, um, it's almost like accident. So this is how uh, accidental findings can be interesting in anatomy. Um, also, last, uh, last little thing. Um, in this idea to uh, provide uh, our pipeline uh, for other people to use it um, on their own cords, we want to make sure that uh, our dissection 
formulas, our errors can be reused. So um, we reuse ourselves this pipeline on uh, the other court of the HCP data set of the HCP, uh, the 3T court. So uh, it's the same participants, but stand with um, um, with a magnet of uh, lesser intensity. And you should expect something um, with a um, smaller resolution. Um, you could expect something worse or at least different. So what we have uh, seen when doing this, so I, I have taken uh, one of the internal facts, the oyster facts that I showed you before, uh, as an example here. Um, so the purple is our uh, 70 court, like the original HTTP court. Um, the blue, uh, the yellow is the one that we found in the 3T HTTP court. S uh, same participants, but different quality of data. Um, and we also uh, wanted to compare it to uh, another cohort with completely different um, participants, different subjects, uh, to uh, uh, make sure that the differences that we see between the purple and the yellow are not um, are not hidden by the fact that the participants are the same, because we expect a higher level of analogy uh, between the findings as they are the same people. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I don't remember if I said this. So this is uh, the Fidelity cohort, uh, French small cohort, like in-house cohort, uh, that, um, that we use um, uh, for comparing. So the results of the comparison, you can see them on the line below, um, to assess um, the differences or um, the similarities, we the overlap between uh, the mean maps, uh, threshold and mean maps. Um, and you can see that when you compare the two HCP um, uh, cohorts, um, you have um, um, Okay, here I, I, I've I taken this example here, but um, maybe I will give you uh, the mean values. That would be more interesting. Well, I don't have them here. I don't want to lose your time. Um, the overlap here is higher than the overlap here. So uh, I expected second people better overlap. Well. Oh, now the general discussion uh, is taking me longer than I thought. I'm sorry. Um, to, um, I divided this, um, it will be short. I divided this part in two uh, sections. The current uses of our atlas because we're lucky it has been published, it's implemented in the software. I'm saying it a lot because it's great and the software is great. It's a DCP kit, download it, use it, it's wonderful. Um, you can uh, use it to assess disconnection syndromes. And our first atlas was mostly, not much, was used uh, partially uh, to assess disconnection syndromes through this uh, BCP kit software. Actually, what we have done is a simple review of the literature um, on the publications that uh, cited our atlas. Um, what we have found is um, um, we did this from November 2015 to December 2019. Um, we, uh, our atlas was uh, cited in one uh, hundred twenty publication at the time, um, and uh, what you can see um, is um, it has been used 
or at least cited um, a lot. One third of the citations is about uh, the use of BC, the BCB kit and um, the, the importance, the, the interest of these atlas for uh, assessing disconnection syndrome. The disconnection syndrome, uh, as a reminder, I can, uh, I can remind you that it's uh, uh, when a patient comes without any uh, cortical lesion, uh, but deep uh, white blood lesion, but it still has uh, some clinical symptoms. Um, so you can uh, um, assess if um, there is a disconnection, functional disconnection, um, by an anatomical disconnection. And you can do that overlapping the scan of your patient with our uh, atlas, because our atlas is like this, the norm. It was done in healthy uh, subjects. So it provides something to compare to. And in bcb 2 kit, you can uh, normalize uh, the data uh, that you put in. So if you have data coming from a patient scan, you can um, repair it, kind of, metrically speaking, to be able to compare it. Like you can inflate the brain if it has, um, if it's not in a comparable shape, and then you can, um, with the software, see um, probability of disconnection in each voxel um, where you have, you can, uh, where you delineate the lesion on the scan uh, of your patient. Um, so, one third of um, citation of the citations are uh, related to that to disconnection syndrome assessment. Um, the other third um, relates to um, the uh, actual uh, anatomy and uh, um, the usage of our maps for other purposes um, than disconnection syndromes. Like research, theoretical application, testing, building of hypotheses based on anatomy, etc. Um, among them, you can see that uh, good people, the, um, it's, uh, it represents 12 publications, they explicitly said that they used our ROIs. Being said that at the time the ROIs were not available uh, like that, they were not not uh, optimized to fit every brain. Um, we gave uh, indication on how uh, people could replicate something like that, and it still got the interest. This so this is why we have tried to meet the needs of uh, of people who want to work with our ROIs and design better ROIs for the next atlas. Um, voila, voila. Mm. You ought to have like one third um, of other things, let's say. Mm. One word on the limitations of the technique uh, of our atlas, um, because I am I, I'm, I talk a lot about its advantages, of course. It has limitations, it's an indirect uh, method, it's uh, his estimated um, reconstruction of brain fibers. Uh, it represents, uh, fortunately, it represents the reality quite well. Um, it has been tested and seen. It's incredible how after many approximations, uh, with MRI with image, we get so close to the truth when we compare it to um, growth anatomy dissections um, or histology. Incredible. Um, also, this atlas was done through um, manual dissection, which implies that it's subjective. It was done by an operator. And uh, there is of course, decision making, um, a lot of parameters, um, preferences, predictions um, in the way you dissect your tract, what you choose to dissect, uh, how you choose to clean your tract, etc. But it has been showed in literature 
that at the end, the impact is not so huge and that different operators, they still come up with the same results or very comparable results, uh, no matter the preferences. So limitations, yes, and at the same time, we can live with them. Um, now, my favorite part, future users, what we can still, uh, what can, we can hope to do with this new atlas. Um, with, um, with the, because of the comprehensiveness of this atlas, because we dissected everything that we could, we were able to um, highlight similarities um, or um, common um, features, common layouts in the brain. Um, that it's that is not possible when we did the frontal lobe atlas. Here, for example, um, we found a similar um, um, relative arrangement of white matter tracts um, in the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the temporal lobe. They may, if they don't look like identical, but they are so similar. You see uh, each time two groups of horizontal tracks, white matter tracks, um, and uh, thicker um, vertical tract, the um, Aslan tract um, that connects the two components of the system. So this was it was possible to notice that because the, we dissected everything and we could um, show everything at the same time in the normative space um, and spot differences and analogies in different structures. Um, so this kind of um, comprehensive atlas can be of use to um, um, create and press toward uh, structures that are usually not so much explored. For example, here, the frontal lobe atlas, this system is pretty well known. Those systems are not really studied like that. They are studied as a part of other networks, like the attentional network, um, the, uh, the vision uh, pathways. But the fact that we can see them in parallel, maybe this can open a new interest toward these um, facts because it might suggest that information flows in the same way and um, in the three areas. And we can use the knowledge that we have on the frontal area to uh, better understand the parietal area and the temporal area. Same goes for um, these two tracks uh, that were before dissected separately. Um, uh, we did this in the previous atlas. Uh, we treated separately um, the orbital frontal tracks and uh, the longitudinal system. But when uh, you see everything together, you almost see, you almost can see these tracks as the entry, the entrance, the gate uh, of the frontal lobe system. Because relative topography that you can see with a comprehensive atlas give you access to uh, this kind of visual analysis. And we hope that this might uh, be of interest for researchers working on different areas that can, they can explore uh, our maps, that they can uh, use our assets to explore further uh, tracks uh, together that were not paired before, that were not seen as structures um, uh, components of the same uh, uh, network, for example. And we also gathered some um, uh, clues on uh, the fact that, uh, for example, these tracks are related to these others uh, from functional literature. So this is inside the PhD uh, manuscript. Um, I will go now to um, something else. Um, we also could see with um, this court funding 
Stephanie, this is your paper. Um, this looks so similar that I wanted to show this and to put this in the manuscript. Um, the some facts when you compare it, like in individuals, uh, our dissection, uh, virtual dissection to uh, growth dissection, it turns out that this is a Kringler uh, dissection uh, improved. Uh, um, uh, like updated uh, preserve the spare the cortex. Uh, when you uh, uh, compare them, it's striking how it's similar. Again, knowing that MRI is an approximation of approximation of reconstruction, etc. Um, um, but the few uses that we hope for these atlas, of course, again, um, we will uh, implement the new version, uh, re replace the previous one or complement the previous one in the BCP toolkit. And we hope that the clinical uses that have been uh, um, done so far uh, will uh, continue. Um, it has been done for planning, uh, it has been used for planning uh, electrodes uh, placement in the brain, surgical uh, procedures, etc. And last but not least, probably my favorite part is um, the reflection on how we present um, for educational purposes um, brain atlases. Um, we put a lot of thought to this um, because I think um, that anatomists, we have a responsibility to make anatomy nice so people make it attractive. Apparently, there is something called neurophobia in uh, medical students that fear uh, brain anatomy. Um, and uh, how could we, why, first, why do they fear brain anatomy? And what can we do to help uh, people to uh, come toward anatomy? It's difficult to apprehend from um, from uh, books, from images, a real 3D structure. So, of course, we are not uh, equals when, um, when it's about um, seeing things in 3D in our head from pictures. So how could we um, help people to apprehend the 3D structure? So here are some ideas inspired by what can be done in photography, what has been done for years in photography. Um, the anaglyph representation with uh, glasses. I've already, be, uh, I've already seen that done uh, uh, in anatomic class by uh, uh, Professor Asboon at uh, the UPMC, um, who gave us glasses, 3D glasses to look at the anatomical structures, um, apprehend their, get this feel, 3D feel. Works. So my experience it works. So with our uh, atlas of our data set and our dissected data set, of course, we can create uh, an infinity of images of everything uh, that could be of interest for people, any tract. And facts are not so much present in literature. It's not so easy to find um, um, what you want to find when you are a young student, um, when you don't know where to look. Um, so another idea also inspired by uh, artistic photography is the GIF animated uh, picture um, that switches um, from images um, taken by two uh, cameras or a camera shifted to mimic your two eyes, um, doing something like that, uh, like with your uh, representation of remote tracks, uh, you can get with really um, not a lot of means a 3D feel of the structure. In black, you have um, a, a circuit, a groove, um, and colored are the colored things are the mean volumes of tracks that connect the two banks of uh, the um, uh, roof. And it's not so easy to apprehend this in 3D because this particular circus is like a river, it's uh, or like a snake, it goes uh, left and right. So mm, on the size, it's not easy to apprehend it 
its uh, uh, topography. So with this kind of image, maybe it can help. Um, another idea was a simple one uh, for a textbook. That's the fact uh, of layering on pieces paper different uh, images, um, like the arrays layered on uh, mean volume, layered on um, individual maps, can actually help to apprehend uh, the anatomy of a structure and also way to dissect it. But it, it's, of course, a very advanced material. Um, beginners in anatomy, they don't do dissection like that. But who knows, maybe in 10 years, we will all start with manual dissection to um, get used to brain anatomy, like in medical studies. So who knows? <laughs> Um, another last thing is um, this very uh, easy way to present a 3D structure. Uh, we used to think, think that the ideal way to present a white matter track would be a 3D print of the track or of the white matter. But yeah, it's it's expensive, it's still expensive, and not easy to, uh, to mail it, to send it to people, uh, take space, and uh, you would have to do this, you can't overlay them, you, you have to choose what structure you print, no, that's, uh, that's a heavy job, <laughs> but how could we do this in a super simple way, we thought I cut out, <laughs> Um, an image printed on a cardboard, on a cutout of a cube, and uh, you have um, something very uh, playful to, to cut out, fold, and actually it gives you a really nice feel of 3D structure. And of course, you can have different types of cutouts. You can have the two halves of a brain. You can imagine everything, slices, various cubes uh, of paper uh, in a book in a in a paper in a in a journal very practical idea with very interesting um, effects voilà. I thank you all very very much for listening uh, to me for the um, this very long journey but I hope that I gave you some interesting information and I look forward for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for, for that presentation. Um, now it's time to, to move on to some questions. Um, if, if we start with uh, Damien Wasserman, uh, but if there are other questions that are um, pertinent or linked, uh, don't hesitate to, to ask them. Okay, so then it's me. First, yeah. thank you for inviting me to the jury. Uh, reading your thesis was a pleasure. It's beautifully illustrated and very nicely written. And I think it's very good material for any future student to, to learn about neuroanatomy and the main points and issues that might come with that. Um, then I, I might go a little bit to the questions. So if I go back a little bit to, um, to the technical part. I want to mm -hmm. see first, just starting with little technical quirks. Uh, when you were speaking about <coughs> the, the, the mean tracts and the voxel visitation maps, mm -hmm. yeah. um, have you detected a specific effect of registration quality there? Have you asked yourself that question? The registration of, quality? Of the quality of the registration of images. Because generally the registration in the white matter is not great. Because it's brain good. registration into a template is usually mostly focused in the yeah. in the cortical features. Yes. Um, um, okay, that, I understand this. Um, the question is how um, how it has impacted our choice, our threat. Yeah, I mean, have you have you have you asked yourself that question? If some of the variability, for instance, 
was there any lobular specificity in terms of the variability of the tracts? Yes, we thought about that, uh, but um, at the stage um, we were, uh, at any stage, um, like we, uh, we already had optimized the normalization. We tried to optimize it as much as possible. So at this point, it was not possible to separate a variability from a problem for the trade. So. Yeah, yeah. I, it, my, my concern was most about the, the point that they were not discussing it. Okay. And <laughs> that, I mean, it, it should be at least called a little bit. Um, okay. Good, but uh, I found very, very interesting the way that you portrayed the threats. I think it's a huge amount of effort, the one that you... That it took to build such an atlas. Can can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. And uh, specifically in the in the results that you showed, I found very interesting the the um, the atlas that you made about the insular region, because I have never seen a tracked atlas of the insula. I worked a little bit on it. Um, I really like the oyster comparison. <laughs> so, I mean, how stable? I I find beautiful the taxonomy argument. How how stable was the were the insular tracks across subjects? Uh, ah, yes, they don't have a wonderful success uh, success rate. Um, in individuals, um, some tracks are always present. Some of these tracks are always here. Um, the 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 red, the violet. Uh, you you still have the image? Um, yeah, I can see. It. Yeah. Um, so the red, the violet uh, are quite constant, the green one too, uh, the frontal ones not so much, uh, and it's different uh, in different courts. And this is probably due to something that I did mention, uh, is that we have noise, uh, superficial noise on the lateral um, Side, side of our scans, the seven test scans of uh, the ET court. So, uh, because it was required from left to right and from right to left, and usually it's from front, uh, front to bottom. So, uh, here noise appeared uh, on the side or for streamlines that were uh, horizontal going um, on a um, coronal uh, pen, uh, following okay. a coronal pen. Anterior posterior direction. Uh, no. Um, oh, on the coronal plane or across the coronal plane? Along the coronal plane. Oh, okay, so so so, so yeah. left to right. Okay, yeah, because it seems there. So then that it's the tracks that are more stable are the ones that are more into the parietal section. Yeah, like connecting the but, insula with the parietal lobe. What what the impact the insula tracks, for example, is that they have a portion that is uh, uh, that is impacted by the noise. So we experience some loss um, for yeah. uh, these tracks. Um, in um, the set pay court, but they were uh, better seen on uh, other courts. Uh, so maybe this is not, um, this is why this is not the perfect example uh, in terms of numbers here, um, but it was um, easy to, to apprehend in terms of uh, visual I mean, uh, terms. But these are the oyster tracks. Um, they are very impacted as uh, small structures, like all the U-shaped short fiber tracks. They will be heavily impacted by any noise. Um, so unfortunately, we have uh, individual differences that probably we will attribute to the noise, uh, but not so much to individual differences. But at the same time, we don't know, and that's uh, that's interesting to explore. Yeah, and do you have an idea on how to explore whether the individual differences are actually meaningful or effect of the noise? Um, do can you think of, uh, about some sort of experiment? I've, I, I, I've seen some um, um, functional functional parcelation of insula um, that could be done in the same uh, in the in the same court. Uh, as um, uh, dissection of uh, anatomical tracts, if we can see uh, that the functional um, uh, the, the function function follows um, 
the anatomical layout at the individual um, uh, level uh, it could mean that it's uh, more related to uh, individual variability. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, then one, one question I had when I was going through your atlas is whether your atlas is representing a specific school of neuroanatomy? Yes. <laughs> uh, and which, what's uh, the with difference with other, other neuroanatomical schools? And why did you choose the school besides that maybe your advisor is part of like it? Um, I will say that um, like anatomy is uh, it's something very sentimental. The way you learn something, it's like with anatomy in general, not only brain anatomy, but in medicine, um, the, the books you've read when you were learning uh, anatomy uh, in the first year, uh, people who taught you uh, anatomy, uh, they remain like engraved in your brain and you, um, you can't help it. You will follow this because uh, it has shaped the framework inside your head, how to dissect things. So you have to force yourself to be curious, to be open-minded when you read other books, other approaches, because they are so, of course, valuable and useful to improve your own approach. Um, and uh, of course, in this atlas, for example, um, I'm for sure uh, on, uh, on the, in the, 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 the La Bande à Michel. I'm in the group of Michel, also influenced by uh, Marco Catani, um, this part is the other two for anatomy. So, um, of course, I'm very influenced by that because I've learned um, white matter tract anatomy with Michel. Um, but um, I force myself also to apprehend tracts uh, with a bottleneck um, strategy um, yep. because. Um, it's not what, we, what I've learned, but uh, you have to do everything to make you do it. So, yeah, it's more about the bottling strategies, about the taxonomy, because there are some some schools that are more founded in uh, monkey neuroanatomy that have a divergence with Catani's version of neuroanatomy. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not understand. Some, like, for instance, the school that comes from Pandya. And mm -hmm. then went into into human anatomy, like Nikos Marquis being one of the main exponents, have a, have some dissent with the school that it's purely human, like Mori or or Catani, which is more human based in terms of some tracks. So I was wondering if you look at the difference in the ways that they define tracks or. Um. Yes and no. <laughs> okay. Um. Um, that, that's very personal. Um, I, mm, I did not fi find this very helpful to look at uh, um, tracing uh, atlases uh, on a, a primate brains, for example. Mm -hmm. It's personal. I think you have to look at this to understand what you are doing. Uh, but it's so... Um, mm, it, it, it's different and, and at the personal level if you can't if you can't um, change it in your own brain like the the way you see them in the monkey if you can translate it in a human brain then you need to, to force it so and, uh, okay. it's, it's important to compare but um, in my case it was uh, a posteriori so after I've dissected, I've looked at um, things in human, then I've looked uh, to what was done in primate brain. Good. One more question about results, and then uh, probably a general remark, and I'll pass the word. Uh, when you were showing the intrastriatal fibers, yeah, can, can you show them on the slide again, please? Yeah, there. So for what I see there, Mm -hmm. What you're having is uh, some voxels that might be white matter, but it's mostly gray matter voxels. Uh, no. It's supposed to be uh, gray matter voxels, like the ROI, you mean? The... Yeah, I mean, the voxels were, I mean, in general. So how are you 
finding the tracks because okay. it, for any tractography algorithm, this will be a very challenging uh, task. Okay, this is what is great about manual dissection. It's that you can choose how deep you go in white matter when you trace your error, inclusion error wise. So here, for example, oops, I tried to um, remain in the gray matter. Uh, but at the same time, if you uh, go a little beyond, it's not, uh, it's not even dangerous because you won't get other fibers. Um, 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 you will only get, get unpatriotal fibers because you have length threshold, because you have, um, you say to, you, uh, in your dissection formula, is uh, um, starting in the pink area, ending in the purple one. So, you can't. You, you don't really risk something if you go uh, beyond gray matter, and it's even better because, unfortunately, with tractography uh, algorithms, sometimes you have fibers that don't reach the gray matter; that that they are just below the gray matter. But uh, you know that they are part of the track. So I've, I think I've, I've been very restrictive in my dissection strategy. So uh, I prefer to. Uh, eliminate a lot of fibers, um, even if they were okay, uh, because I wanted the, the less artifacts possible in, uh, in my dissections. This is the choice. This is the choice. Um, so this was the, the, the strategy. And um, based on that, depending on the ROI, sometimes I went uh, far inside the white matter because it had no, uh, I took no risk doing that um, because of other um, parameters. Okay. Um, yeah, my main point is how do you know? It's the same thing with the insular tracks that are very superficial. How do you know that what the algorithm is giving you actually represents white matter? That that's my main. I mean, how much there is what you're expect you, what you're expecting to find as a neuroanatomist and mm -hmm. how much it's what the data is really telling you. And if you have some sort of, you know, uh, how do you say, uh, introspection into your process about that. How much are you yourself biasing your own process in terms of the data? You know, like you, are, you don't know with, uh, with uh, um, um, reconstructed anatomy. So, from the moment that you know that you can't be 100% sure that you have to doubt everything, uh, you, 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 you do that, you, um, you, you feel if it's correct or not. And of course, you have to check literature in growth dissection, um, in uh, axiological uh, analysis. You always have to double check if it has been found uh, like with real means. Uh, Okay, so you go back to gross dissection and literature to, to confirm. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I, yeah. but sometimes it's uh, uh, I've seen cases of drugs that have not been reported that were systematically destroyed with gross dissection, but that that were uh, systematically reported with um, um, virtual dissection. So there were debates: on, uh, are yeah. they artifact or not? Because they seem real, they look like real uh, tracks, they connect uh, area that are expected to be connected, um, but they have, would we can't see them. And I don't know how the debate has been solved. I think for at least one track, I think at least for one of them, it has been solved. I don't know how they finally found it somehow with tracing studies. Or something. Uh, maybe with um, ex vivo uh, tracing studies in humans, something like that. So. Uh, like the, fi the final proof was that uh, it was an actual fact, something like that. <laughs> yeah, this goes back to the to the fight between a uh, monk in your anatomist doing staining and then going to the man and yeah. uh, virtual dissectors. Good. That, that's all my questions. I, I just want to underline that, again, reading your manuscript was a beautiful experience. And Thank I you. think that the way in which you can go from designing a methodological system to, to define an, an anatomical system and then take it from the data to applications such as age and um, 
and then how can you can open applications to other people coming after you it's a really uncommon uh achieved thesis and commonly achieved thesis and i yield my word thank you <laughs> thank, thank you very much uh, uh daniel uh, do you want to carry on I, I would, yes, I would love to carry on. Thank you. Um, also, I, I just want to echo uh, Damien's points. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, attend the defense and to read the thesis and to be able to um, engage in the discussion here. Um, I, I um, am from a different field focusing also on connectivity, but mainly functional connectivity. And so many of my questions are gonna be broader, um, but also asking, kind of the uh, questions along the general theme of um, functional implications of what you've observed here. Um, so, so I think one of the general questions is, um, what is the influence of the patterns you're observing in white matter tracks on function? Or what can we learn about the, um, uh, let's say the functional implications of the um, organizing patterns that you're observing in this atlas? Uh, I'm really not familiar with functional um, approaches, most because I focus on anatomical approaches. But uh, my first uh, internship was uh, on uh, functional MRI. So maybe I have a very basic, very childish um, view, a beginner's view on that. Um, um, I, I, I think um, um, layouts uh, revealed by anatomy as clues um, uh, to, to build, um, as, as a material to build a functional hypothesis that uh, functional uh, approaches. Again, you have completely different approximations. It's, um, if you rely on a, on a bold signal, uh, it's something completely different. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, approximation plus approximation at the end you have something uh, good if you can uh, combine uh, both approaches, uh, like in the um, uh, in uh, how our master did this uh, using anatomy to understand functions. Um, but I, honestly, I don't know how <laughs> I would be something effective. like that. If I could reformulate it, maybe not not functional in the sense of the data, but uh, mm -hmm. in terms of functional specialization, you alluded in the introduction to the uh, critical role that white matter paths play in um, the function of the brain itself. So dismissing the question of functional MRI methodology, but in okay. terms of understanding specialization of the cortex, um, uh, what can we learn from this atlas about the way oh. the different fun functions are distributed? Okay, in this case, um, to explore that, we'll need to do something completely, um, something additional as to um, compare um, the um, I mean, volumes, the importance, the relative importance of tracks, um, the areas they project on, the, 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 the volumes, the you know, um, with spherical deconvolution, with uh, um, pipeline, we don't have uh, um, um, classical uh, MD, uh, classical parameters. I think we have HMOA, but we did not um, use in uh, the, the, the whole brain atlas, but we used this um, in the frontal lobe atlas. Um, and uh, we did uh, correlations. Uh, um, we looked at uh, there were links between education and uh, anatomy, and we found some uh, um, significant correlation between that. Uh, but you have to use statistics and for the final atlas. We did not do that. Uh, actually, we did. Maybe in the paper we'll do something, but not at the uh, stage of the manuscript of the thesis, which focused was something a little different. But yeah, I think um, 
it's something that we could definitely do with the data because everything is already available. Um, we so have maybe to, to sort of take that point further. What what sorts of experiments could you envision in the future to further probe um, the functional implications of, of uh, these white matter connections? Um, okay, yeah, we uh, we already envisioned something. Um, I'm not. I'm not uncomfortable talking about um, about things that I don't. Um, um, it, it seems you've already laid the foundation for that in the um, investigation of the, the the variance across individuals with various uh, measures. In this case, age and uh, was it education? But yes. um, could you expand that, for instance, could you expand that behavioral, the, the spectrum of behaviors that are with, assessed? With the HCP uh, data set, we have a neuropsychological data. We have, uh, right. like, uh, it's available, we have them, etc. We have even teens, and um, it's an interesting court. Um, what could we uh, choose from that? Uh, I don't even know because uh, if, when you have a choice, when you don't have an a priori hypothesis, I think it's, it's not easy to answer this question because um, I don't have a need to investigate something a function, so I don't have ideas <laughs> right now. Okay. Um, well, maybe to then focus back, as, as I mentioned, I'm really a novice when it comes to uh, diffusion weighted imaging based approaches, so it was excellent to um, be introduced to that further through your, your work. Um, what are the minimal, part of what you described was the ability to use the tools to um, map out the same atlas in other in novel data sets, right? Mm -hmm. What are the kind of minimal constraints on data acquisition that are necessary in order to use this toolbox? What are the, I know that there are many parameters that can be um, modified. Could you, do you have any sense from the um, reliability testing that you conducted of what's necessary? I think that we, I know that we can try this on any uh, data set with at least six direction diffusion directions um, that is normalized. If you normalize your data set, you can try to use the ROIs. Um, and actually, I don't think that there are more restrictions to that. Um, the closer that you are uh, from our parameters, the closer um, uh, will be your result, result in terms of like the general density of the general spanning of uh, uh, terminations, the general uh, heaviness of white matter tracks. But we're not quite on any kind of data set, no matter the quality. Uh, if it's in the same normative space, you can um, you can uh, open your ROIs uh, in everything. Of course, um, if um, with some parameters that we can say are less good, less uh, protective, um, because sometimes it's it's what you want to have. Um, so that that track that you can't see with certain parameters. Um, so some of the dissection formulas won't work um, in certain data sets. But for example, the dissection formulas for formulas cartoon they will work no matter what if you have six direction and a normalized data set. Cool. Um... So maybe to take a, a step back from the functional question, but to focus more on kind of general trends or patterns that were observed, especially within the frontal lobe. Um, I was struck by your use of the map metaphor uh, because one of the challenges with a map is to be able to reduce the data to its meaningful components, um, to be able to capture what's most essential for informing the reader or whomever about the, the basic mm -hmm. Um, most crucial features of spatial layout, let's say. Mm -hmm. So the question I would ask is, um, in the atlas, what were some of those features beyond the individual tracks when you look across them? 
Um, can you generalize any spatial principles of what was observed in the organization? Um, we replicate, we re replicated the general principles that are um, that have been um, uh, highlighted through uh, throughout the history of brain research. I, I, I'm not sure that I understand this correctly, but um, um, are we talking about like the general organization in terms of uh, way it might really out like the type, the categories of way matter tracks, or um, who is under which track is uh, more superficial, which one is uh, deeper, things like that, or more like a TBSS skeleton aspect, uh, like the general path streams uh, uh, that follow that the fibers can follow. I'm not sure if it's. Uh, Oh, I, I guess I was personally curious about the um, observations regarding the way in which tracks are laid out with respect to each other and how uh -huh. that helps to understand the way in which um, connectivity across different cortical regions might follow large scale patterns. It's an open question. I'm, I'm just genuinely, genuinely curious. Ron. I've noticed with um on such a record that um, um, when you when you use the, um, the, the threshold maps, uh, you end up, like you said, with uh, information reduced to the minimum. Uh, like on a map, you have only the main axis of a road. Right? You don't have everything around it. Um, so like that, um, it's um, it's easier to much easier to um, understand to predict to apprehend the general layout of uh, of um, white matter tracks because doing so you um, um, like with the representation that we have here um, we mostly show the the belly of the track we don't see the cortical projections um, so. Um, your um, uh, your um, view of white matter is not is not polluted by uh, individual variability polluted between uh, guillemets because um, at uh, individual uh, level it, it's it's um, it's not something that you should discard but at the um, population level um, it's more interesting to look at uh, um, the main axis of uh, white matter tracks to predict where they should be. Um, when you look at the uh, track terminations, uh, you have some smaller tracks that are uh, like uh, inside, crawled inside bigger terminations. So uh, when you dissect uh, tracks, you can predict where you will find your smaller U-shaped tracks, etc. Uh, but it's very locally. When you look at um, the belly of the tracks, um, you can predict when dissecting or when exploring, or from a, a lesion assessment point of view, um, which uh, track will be uh, close to the other one. Because in the brain, uh, you, you don't have a lot of uh, choice. Either like long tracks, you can, can either run through the um, external capsule or uh, on the outside, uh, on the top. Um, you don't have um, a lot of uh, um, it can't vary too much from um, like the norm. And this is how you can predict um, what, track to ex what track to expect close to the other one. And also um, when you are in an exploratory uh, um, way of doing things, um, you know where to look at uh, fibers that have not been dissected. And maybe you can also uh, guess which fibers are artifacted or not based on this kind of um, uh, based on the general layout. It gives you um, a sense of um, um, not accuracy, but um, I don't have. I, I have lost the word. Um, In, uh, so in the interest of time, maybe I should wrap up, but um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for very cool work and uh, yeah, looking forward to 
exploring further. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, David. You've uh, David Daniel. Um, you, you that's enough for you. You've you finished. Yeah, I think in the interest of time, it's good to. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Um, we have two uh, um, examiners. Don't, um, there is Stephanie and Laurent. Um, Stephanie, do, do you want to, to start off? You need to, yeah, activate your Lovely. mic. Thank you so much. Um, also for me, congratulations. It was a pleasure reading your thesis and I absolutely loved your uh, quite novel way of showing the anatomy, quite stunning illustration so well done for that one um also thanks for the presentation very thorough and interesting there's a couple of questions that um came up on my side so one for example is that you used 178 hcp um volunteers and i was wondering given the results that you showed later for the front as land track for example where the highest degree of overlay across your cohort was about 40% if you were actually able to dissect all the tracts and all the people and the two hemispheres yes. if they are bilateral and how you then explain uh, that at the core of the tract you only get about 40%. Let me see. Um, I think the success rate for the um, frontal admin tract was pretty high. Uh, which means that it was actually dissected uh, in um, almost all the um, participants. Uh, it's from memory, and I, I don't uh, remember the exact uh, success rate. Um, but the low um, overlap rate, uh, right, this is, um, I understood correctly, you were talking about the overlap. Uh, right. Yes, you had the slide where you showed all the voxels and the um, percentage. There we go, that one. So okay. the highest was 40% at the core of the tract. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, the, we decided every, almost all the um, participants, but because we worked with data, uh, seven Tesla data, so data of uh, um, High resolution. This is uh, this can be discussed if they are if they are better or not than uh, the 3T the three tested data. But one thing that we have noticed is that we uh, recover a lot of um, um, like a, a, a widespread of uh, cortical terminations. Um, so. Um, the, the 60 percent of this part of the distribution, um, when you look at it, it's not uh, it's not aberrant. It's not so um, different actually. They're yeah, close to each other. They don't overlap a lot because the resolution is good, and um, uh, um, in this kind of uh, diagram, uh, you will see fibers like run, running really close to each other and in another data set like a three Tesla, they will be uh, reconstructed as the same one. Um, and this is close to the surface because uh, on the belly of the track this has a, um, it doesn't really uh, matter. But on the cortical um, the termination uh, uh, area, this impacts a lot. And you uh, may have the, um, you or everyone, we may have the impression that it's worse, that 40% uh, is not good. Um, but it doesn't mean that we um, don't uh, find, uh, we can't find uh, the general anatomy of the drug. The opportunity is to it's just that we have to interpret it in a different way. Um, our previous assets where we put 50% um, threshold everywhere, like based on the yes or no um, uh, logic, um, arbitrarily, um, because it was possible we had a data set, um, three data, data set, um, and we did not recover as much um, individual variability in the cortical terminations. So in this map, um, there is an interest to look at both the uncontrolled map 
explore the terminations and the solid map to um, see uh, probably an extremely accurate uh, main uh, trajectory of uh, each act. So, so speaking about the difference between the 3T and the 7T, so if you repeat the same analysis in the 3T data, would you see a higher percentage in the overlap in the core of the tract or just the cortical terminations? Um, we tried to, I did not try to explore this. I have to pay an homage to, uh, to my companion because he tried that on the, on the, the, the data sets. Um, and uh, honestly, I would have to ask him if he, yeah, how, what are the differences that he, um, he has seen? I think we have found nothing, if I remember correctly, we have found nothing um, significant in terms of difference, uh, except that in general, um, uh, between the 3T and the uh, 7T, um, like it's more, more an impression that uh, the overlap is higher uh, on, in the 3T. Um, you look at the maps, you have this impression that um, the lowest, um, like there is a wider spread of voxels um, closer to the cortex in the 70, and that tracks are more tight in the 3T. So you might actually pick up some of the variability from um, inter individual variability, basically, at a higher yes. resolution. Yeah, yes. Um, okay, um, the other question I had, so you, you nicely showed this, oh, my headphones are dying. <laughs> you nicely showed this figure of um, your regions of interest, the exclusion and the inclusion um, regions. And I was wondering how you decided which streamlines to include and which ones not to include, especially in a 70 data set, it's quite messy. So how did you, decide which ones are false positive, false negatives. And then as the second step, you, um, you prepared an atlas of the brain, right? So I was wondering if you saw connections you didn't expect, and you also described, for example, the meso anterior fasciculus, that is a no other atlas, mm -hmm. and how you then, given that you chose the regions of interest and made that judgment call on the false positive and false negative, how did you then decide whether or not that was an actual tract. Oh, that was uh, free that's to break hard. it down. <laughs> <laughs> that was challenging. I'm sure I I, uh, I did mistakes on that because it's so arbitrary. Um, you, it's based on uh, um, on intuition, uh, like the the the. the Veracity, the potential veracity of a, of a streamline is not easy, it's not easy to assess. Uh, but a lot of things are done, uh, but for me, I, I did a lot of things by analogy for the SAF and the MAF, for example, to text that uh, run uh, um, on the sagittal uh, axis in, in the frontal lobe. Um, the SAF has been implemented by analogy, I think, okay, I should do the same. Um, by analogy, in, uh, in, the, in uh, the middle and the inferior gyrus, uh, because the, the, the first one was in the superior and middle gyrus. Let's do the same thing in the other two gyrus, uh, diary. It has worked. No proof of if it's real or not. It looks um, possible. Um, but this is why in the others we've mentioned when something uh, seemed um, it was um, uh, almost for sure existing, reported in literature several times. Uh, things that are completely uh, novel, uh, where it's just like sometimes a leap of faith. <laughs> um, and I would say that uh, if we are not sure, and that we hope that other people will explore. But um, why it was not so risky uh, to take this leap of faith? It's because um, from the beginning, I think we were really restrictive, restrictive with um, the um, length threshold, the uh, um, exclusion rights, with everything um, to um, eliminate all the obvious noise, all the 
um, artifacts, like missing construction artifacts, um, that you can see if you look really close, especially in group 70, sometimes you see uh, turns that are not uh, anatomically plausible. Um, so even if the required structure looks okay, um, if you have fibers that have a too strong of a sharp of a turn, maybe you prefer to exclude them. But sometimes they did not exclude such um, fibers. Um, they were excluded by themselves <laughs> during the uh, mean computation process. This is quite interesting also to work with set uh, because sometimes if you have like a subpopulation of fibers in your track, that might be another tract uh, or uh, artifacted fibers, like fused fibers, fused with uh, fibers of another tract. Um, when you do the mean uh, computation, you lose them. It's not uh, anymore in the yellow part. Uh, they are not um, uh, statistically strong enough to appear on the mean map. Um, so somehow uh, we were hoping that um, unrealistic fibers uh, would uh, disappear, knowing that we already checked everything like twice to avoid uh, artificial fibers, and that we've tracked that uh, seem plausible, uh, were similar to uh, other tracks found. Um, it's uh, an arbitrary de decision. I think. In any way, if, if you're wrong, you have to report it uh, just for, for letting people know that you have, you, you've seen that. Uh, open the debate on the existence or not, uh, or, the, or the non-existence of the track, and hoping that people will check this uh, with growth detection. If I don't have access to growth detection. I would have liked to check for some, uh, some of the tracks, like the, the math, for example, or the modular tracks. Um, I don't. I'm not sure that we can dissect them, so, so we can see them with growth so, dissection. But one thing I can tell you from experience is that doing uh, Klingler dissections won't give you a definitive answer because it basically has the same limitations that you can see with tractography that you have to peel away the cortex and you can artificially create or miss um, connections. So I guess looking at, as we said before, for example, the monkey literature tracing Klingler dissection and build that story with clinical data as well, um, mm. will probably give you an answer at some point, whether or not those tracts do exist. Um, right, one more question, and then I have one comment, and then I hand over to you. <laughs> um, so you, the atlas is based on the volume of the track, basically. So the voxels that are intersected by streamlines, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, but in your introduction, you also introduced the concept of fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity, all those diffusion indices. And I was wondering if you looked at them at all, because I seem to have missed that they continued in the story. And if so, what, what you found in terms of indices? Um, we have not looked at them uh, in the second atlas. Mm, we looked at Moa in the first one. Um, but um, the, the, the fact that when we convert um, streamlines uh, in, uh, when we binarize uh, um, a, stream, a structure made of streamlines, it's, it's already using the anisotropy because the streamline represents the direction, main direction of diffusion. Um, so in some way we use this uh, um, this proxy um, but uh, indeed it's not use uh, um, diffusion indexes uh, per se um, in the um, in the total, uh, atlas and do we want to do that should, should we do this uh, I'm not even sure that uh, it's mandatory for for every study. I have the impression that we use these values because they are here. Um, 
always like in almost in an automatic way uh, is it was not in this sense that it was not justified by uh, a particular need um, to describe further the tracks um, because they have blurred the general presentation the general presentation of the anatomy I think it could have given um, much information that would not help to uh, apprehend the um, topography of facts because uh, like this approach was really based on the geometry and um, the, um, the analysis assessment of this kind of parameters uh, give you gives you information on millennialization um, things like that the implicit parameters of the facts um, I'm not sure that it will be interesting here in the context that we do not compare, we do not use um, um, other data like aging or um, see it if, for example, aging has an impact on the alienization and like in a purely geometric approach, um, and it made no, no sense to Again, putting a clinical hat on, it might be interesting to have like a normative range of values for an atlas. And then if you have a patient with a lower uh, measure of indices, for example, you could then get an estimate of where on the spectrum your patient falls. Yeah, just as sure an example. We, I'm not sure that we could actually compare uh, values that we um, see um, um, like compare the geometry and uh, uh, in, in an atlas like that and uh, what, uh, the, what the anatomy of a patient uh, seems uh, um, easier, uh, more legitimate than comparing values. Uh, I wonder if uh, um, it, would be, um, it would be okay to compare, to have like a norm of uh, like a scale of uh, expected uh, mean diffusivity in uh, uh, one or another tract, um, and then to see, like, uh, you know, in the Carnet de Santé, uh, uh, children books uh, with the expected uh, um, weight and high, uh, depending mm -hmm. on uh, the age. I honestly, that, that that's interesting to, to look at that. Would it be possible? Um, because um, the, how could you be sure, how, how, will, how can you be sure that you assess these parameters in the same way? Um, mm, the, what is the impact, the influence of the, uh, the acquisition, the sequence? Uh, to it has quality. to be a caveat that it's limited to the data range that you acquired. Yes. I guess so. Um, but yeah. Um, Final question, comment um, that I had is that you nicely introduced the localizationist approach in your introduction, for example. Um, and you said that the lesion approach whereby you just plot all the lesions in the same space and you overlay them is a nice example of localizationism. And I was wondering how your approach is different from that other than that you didn't use lesions, but tracts in a normalized space and you put them over each other, and then, yeah. Oh, I'm not sure that I've understood the question. Um, so in, in the introduction, you introduced a localizationism approach mm -hmm. to brain anatomy. And one example that you gave was the lesion method whereby you define a lesion in a normative space and you plot them all together. Mm -hmm. And then in your atlas, you basically use the same approach for your connections. You have them in a normative yes. space and you plot them together. So why is your approach not a localizationist approach? Um, okay, I see. Um, maybe it is. <laughs> um, 
no, right. It's not, it's not because we're talking about connections that it's not a, a localizationist approach, and that's not true. You got me here. <laughs> I don't know what to answer. Um, so, okay. It was a tricky question. Um, it may be methodologically the same, but you have a different framework underneath, right? So you don't ascribe one region to one function, but you have the connection between different regions and the interpretation of the results will be a different one. So it's a different framework. Okay. Even though in terms of the methods it is, okay. it is a similar method. That's, that was tricky because I, it took me a... Uh... <laughs> I'm done. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Laurent, say yes. for you now. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, let me first congratulate you again as uh, uh, the other people for, for your very impressive work. Very, very mm -hmm. impressive. As um, a user of TrackVis and someone who track a lot of things. I really uh, can imagine the amount of work that it represents to uh, to produce this uh, this atlas. So, so I congrat congratulate you a lot for that. So of course, since I'm, I am the fourth, um, there's a series of questions that have been already uh, discussed. Um, and um, I would have um, maybe only two two different questions. The first one was still uh, uh, related, is still related to the, um, to the binarization of the, uh, of the bundles that you, you did. Mm -hmm. What different type of results would you expect if you, uh, if you are not keeping all the voxels visited, especially the ones which are only visited one time, only mm -hmm. one time? You see, if you really just take uh, everything visited at least two or even, even at least five times, uh, what yeah. would be the difference? I think if we, um, uh, if we choose to keep only just visited at least two times, we will uh, change completely the um, value distribution profile um, because a lot of, um, um, a lot of, um, uh, boxes that you see here are um, visited um, only a few times, like one or two. Um, so that would that would be the, probably the best way to artificially or like uh, on purpose uh, clean the dissection from uh, the individual variability to get uh, something um, with. Um, with a cut off uh, closer to uh, um, uh, higher than 50%. It may be uh, scary for some people to see a cut off at uh, uh, lower than 50%. Um, so it could be actually a way to artificially raise the, um, the, the, um, the, the where you would threshold, uh, how you would threshold, where you would threshold your map, but at the same time you lose doing so you lose um, um, individual variability because uh, yeah. voxels that are visited one time they are not um, they're, they're not um, they could be artifacts maybe they are not. It, depending on what you want to show and what you want to explore, um, we want to also provide these untreated maps where you can see voxels where uh, they were uh, only once in the entire cord, one fiber going through this voxel. And again, it's um, yeah, maybe one uh, one. Uh, it's a little too low. <laughs> uh, usually one is exceptional. Uh, says that I have uh, one visitation uh, uh, rate. Mm, maybe we can exclude them. But ooh, ooh, it's already too much. It's already um, um, 
heavy. <laughs> it already means that it's a, it's a place to be for fibers at this track. I don't know, it's a choice that it will certainly, must certainly impact heavily um, the profile that we, we obtain. And I did, personally, I did not thought about uh, doing that and it's very interesting. Um, okay. Um, so, <clears throat> um, you already said today that, um, yeah, and uh, that you, you compare the results from between 7T and 3T. Are you you were expecting some different, not so much differences? I'm either um, I'm even um, thinking that it's even not a question of if it's 7T or 3T uh, mm -hmm. uh, data, but it's more an issue of the algorithm that you are using for the tractography. And so um, during the comparison that you made, you you always run the same type of algorithm, right? Yes. So, um. Um, like this, uh, for the phenotype cohort, it was a comparable uh, tracking algorithm, but uh, um, not, uh, I think, not exactly the same. Uh, but very similar, yes. For the for we, we compared uh, comparable things, so but for it, the yeah. it's sure the same, the same, uh, the same thing. So uh, if I remember well in your manuscript, this is a deterministic approach in the algorithm. Yes. yes. Yeah. So kind of it, uh, it's still the same question of um, what would you expect uh, for all the atlas uh, uh, extent if you were used uh, an algorithm which is more probabilistic, which is, uh, which is giving you more, uh, probably more uh, streamlines, even more false positives, so a lot of more work to uh, extract everything. But um, yes, if you, you really use an algorithm that which is, let's say, more productive in terms of, of streamlines, um, I was thinking especially on that um, when I was looking at your results of the uh, corticothalamic or corticostriatal uh, projections, or even for the from for the corpus callosum, mm -hmm. where, uh, of course, with your ninety percent percentile, uh, your ninety percentile, you uh, you you have just the main the main part of the of the of the bundle which is which is shown. But uh, uh, it sounds for me that uh, uh, the most lateral part of the corpus callosum is missing, and maybe due for to the uh, type of algorithm that was chosen at the beginning? Um, maybe, um, yeah, I have two, two, two things to answer to this question. Um, um, maybe um, the data set that we had, as it, uh, it has a lot of noise um, for fibers that, uh, for hor uh, horizontal fibers going from left to right, um, we can see uh, an impact of that on a lot of uh, tracks, even projection tracks. Uh, um, um, when they, if, if they curve to a certain angle, if they go towards a certain direction, we lose fibers on in the set uh, that I said. And this is something that we don't see in the 3T when we compare uh, visually the tracks that we dissect. Um, uh, about um, another algorithm, especially uh, probabilistic track, uh, uh, tracking algorithm, I think it would be a nightmare to dissect manually. <laughs> hmm. yes. um, but um, it's probably more interesting for projection tracks, like big tracks, heavy tracks, that we already know that they project everywhere on the cortex. Um, so we're not really scared to get um, false positives uh, because we, for, for projection tracks, we will work more with um, like the statistical meaning of this track or the in terms of projection on the cortex. But um, um, 
um, this kind of algorithm for small uh, short QG spec, I, I don't think that it would be suitable. And um, in an, when you do one atlas, uh, I don't know how um, how badly it could affect um, uh, the result to mix too much uh, different approaches. Uh, if you do um, on the same core, like uh, um, if you run one algorithm deterministic and one probabilistic, um, if your result contradicts, um, maybe because um, you've uh, you've tried many things and even if one approach is most suitable for a certain type of tax and the other for another type of tax, um, we had to choose a, we had to pick a line, a lane, because uh, otherwise, um, I think it could have had an negative impact on our results. And of course, you can do a patchwork of like some tracks we select them with one type of algorithm, the other ones for another type. But this is what I think. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that uh, uh, to get this uh, related topography uh, um, exploration or uh, um, showing in your atlas, you have to do everything in, with the same um, pipeline. Um, and probably we have chosen a pipeline that is more suited for short chain tracks because there are the less known tracks um, and probably one can see that in th this atlas is a little oriented toward that. Um, the, this might explain why we did not want to, or we did not look for uh, assessing uh, uh, millennialization, things like that, like we could have done for like uh, the studies, uh, the actual studies uh, nowadays of uh, big association tracks, commercial tracks that are well known, but that continue to be explored uh, further. So, for example, for projections for the corpus callosum, um, the, the, they could have been explored in a different way and probably better. But somehow our atlas was oriented toward uh, shape fibers and um, dangerous to use probabilistic um, algorithms for that because uh, you will get a lot of false uh, negative, I think, U-shaped um, uh, false negatives, so I don't know. Okay, okay, thank you. And, um... And again, I really congratulate you about uh, this uh, this beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. Hey, thank you, Laurent. Um, Michelle, uh, maintenant, uh, it's it's your turn to, uh, to add uh, whatever you wish uh, about uh, Catherine. Um. Sorry, I have my daughter with me. Would like to uh, oh. join me, uh, congratulating you for your work. And, oh, uh, that's so nice! Fantastic achievement you've been able to do, uh, and I can't stress that enough. In only a year of PhD, um, so very proud of you and uh, delighted I had the chance to work with you. That's all I had to say. Thank you. I will. I'm the lucky one. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, um, and thank you for for this uh, this discussion, which went way over my head, to be perfectly honest, um, but was uh, extremely interesting nonetheless. What I could follow. Um, we now need to discuss as a jury. Uh, not entirely sure how we do. We go to another part of the Zoom, and then away we'll come back uh, in a fairly short time and um, tell you what we think streamed right is that a cat yes <laughs> <laughs> okay we were uh, entertaining the, the people on the uh, who are still on youtube <laughs> with our cat well cats don't like zooms they like to be the center of attention which is not fair to you because this is your day 
we have been discussing clearly and we are completely agreed that the quality of your work is exceptionally high and that you more than merit the title of doctor of Sorbonne University. So congratulations for that. Nowadays, Sorbonne University does not give a mention, just everyone just gets the same thing, but the jury feel that the quality of your work was such that we would like to give you verbally our unanimous um, felicitation um, for the quality of your work. So congratulations, Dr. Rojkova. Thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. I'm so grateful for, for everything, for all your uh, comments, the questions, the remarks, your patience. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you Stephanie, you have much. the right idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Champagne. She's shy. Michelle, do you want to say something? I just thought there was a turn of the cat. Uh, yeah, well, bravo. So you made it, Dr. Roshkova. I was delighted working with you. Um, it, was, uh, it was really fantastic. Uh, what do you want to do next? Oh, no, retire. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Have a uh, holiday. All right. If you want to do an atlas of the monkey brain, yeah, <laughs> just mm. acquired like sixteen monkeys. So <laughs> I prefer human brains. All right. Yes. Yeah, okay. so if you do it on a monkey, you could then uh, perfuse the monkey and actually look at the tracks in real real life afterwards, and then you'll know whether your method works. Ah, oh, yeah. Right. You could. You could. Also, axonal tracing doesn't see everything because of the way it deems out as it's projecting. So we well, unfortunately don't have... Yeah. You could do clarity and actually look and see what's there. You could. Take forever on a monkey brain, mind. You could. And the other problem is like you can only inject one area, eventually two, but you know, you cannot have the full connectivity of a single monkey. Doctor, can, you, you could use that clarity. that's telling us that it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to focus. It's hard to focus, but I'm still here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like all these methods that look at connections have limitations and, you know, I think with the data set that Katrina had and the time she spent doing the dissection, we have the best we can do uh, for now. But future data set may give us like a, the opportunity to see more. Just to intersect quickly, uh, Katrina, you might want to check YouTube uh, later on. I keep the comments, but people are congratulating you over there as well. Oh, OK. Um, was on the page, but I closed it. Oh, yeah, we'll see. You wanted to uh, live uh, stream? Uh, uh, the YouTube live stream? Yeah, maybe it's time to... Um, to stop the live stream? Yeah, to say bye to everyone. No, I don't know, because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how people stayed. 13 people are still... It was a good turnout over there. <laughs> well, let's say goodbye to everyone yes, on YouTube. Congratulations, Doctor. Thank you very much. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you.